Barnes. My guests today are two very well-known artists working in Los Angeles, George Herms and his wife Pixie Herms. They call themselves the junk sculptor and the painter. And actually it's appropriate because they uh, do make their life work that way. Many of us are envious of couples who can actually work in studios all day long and get satisfaction having that kind of lifestyle. Many of us suffer with day jobs and then find that we can only do the art at night. So it's exciting to see these two. We'll start with George. George Herms is world famous as an artist. He's had shows at the Whitney Museum in New York, at our local museum, Los Angeles County Art Museum here. He's represented in the uh, Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena. And mostly he's been known as a junk sculptor or a collector of junk, doing everything himself. In the uh, age of minimal art, he's like Martin Purrier in that he makes everything from scratch, finding bits and pieces of things that he puts together in a magical way. His wife Pixie is an artist, very direct, very uh, flamboyant, quite the opposite of her husband, but somehow they merge and it's really fun to be with them. We'll start with George. Welcome, George. Thank you. You and I went to college together. We went to Berkeley. We were in a show called The Dybbuk by Shalom Ash. I was the Virgin Mary. You were Joseph. And we didn't see each other until the art world 20 years later. How did that happen? How did you become an artist after being an actor and an engineer? I went on a search to try and find a life's work that would involve not just the engineer's brain, but the soul and all the other centers that need to be developed. And I, in an aircraft factory in Santa Monica, I worked, uh, went to the jungles of Mexico, looking for my soul, never found it. But I ran into poets and artists here in Los Angeles that just opened the door for me. What was it like in the early days here in LA in the art world? You've said you've had to drive 15 miles and stay overnight to find another artist. Well, that's it. I knew uh, seven people around Los Angeles. We all lived about 45 minutes away from each other and would uh, literally just visit and spend the night and then move on. Who were they? Uh, let's see. I was in Hermosa Beach. Charles Britton, the photographer, was in Venice. Uh, Wallace and Shirley Berman were in Beverly Glen Canyon. Um, Cameron was in what's now called Silver Lake as was the photographer Edmund Teske. Uh, John Altoon's studio was more around uh, where, what uh, became Gallery Row, La Cienega. Um, Artie Richer and his wife Betty were, I, I finally found out uh, what is uh, now Dodger Stadium. It was Chavez Rabin. That's where they lived. You talk about the seven sisters who were teaching at UCLA and kind of had a stranglehold on what kind of art was being turned out. Who were those artists? Uh, well, they didn't really have a, a stranglehold, but these are, <clears throat> excuse me, the tenured faculty from World War II on at, at UCLA. And um, I'll probably leave out some important names. Uh, Lee Mulliken, I mean, these are kind of in order of my favorites. Um, Bill Bryce. Uh, there was a very tough drawing teacher, John Stussy. Um, Oliver Andrews was the sculptor. Uh, Sam Amato uh, Everett uh, Elgard uh, was also a teacher there. Bob Heineken ran the photography department. So they were ensconced, and it, they actually opened up uh, a kind of an appreciation for younger artists. Later. I think we're going to see some of your work now and you can tell us about the pieces. Okay, this piece is uh, called, this is a series called The Poet Heroes of My Youth and this is a sculpture, it's on a ping pong table, it's called uh, The Stone Brothers and it's for Wallace Berman 
and Bob Alexander, who had a place on Sawtell uh, where they uh, printed books of poetry, had poetry readings. Cameron read her poetry there. James Dean came there. Uh, 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 Dennis Hopper, a lot of the Hollywood people came through the influence of the Stone Brothers. Let's move on to the next one. I think you, this is another view of that piece. Uh, these are our recent attempt to kind of salute the people that fed me uh, spiritually. As George, a when person. I go to your studio, there's so much clutter around, yes. excuse it, this and then you take it home and yeah. you have a part of well. you. It's really neat. It's great to see. Yeah, it's very difficult. That's attempting to isolate a piece is a real challenge. This is a close-up of the Stone Brothers, just showing the rusty metal. And the, a, a lot of these objects now come from the estate of Edmund Teske, the photographer. I'm he was here. the first person to actually alter photography when it was, when he, it was still wet. Yeah, I think that the, yeah, the solarization, yeah. Yeah, those, those techniques, I think he was one of the original ones. And then for the last two years, I've been doing roses, which just grow up in the studio. This is the therapy rose. It's, it's a box <laughs> with the life and works of Sigmund Freud. And then um, I believe there'll be an interior showing. These are 360 degree. This is inside the box of the therapy rose. And they're, what I'm doing is a, the poet Robert Duncan, I asked him what he was writing once, and he says, I'm not writing for any particular deadline. I'm just writing to see what I would write if there was no book promised in January. So the roses are, are something that I embarked on just to see what kind of sculptures I would make without having promised an exhibition deadline. So this is the interior. This is another rose. Uh, I have two. Uh, Almost one of them is almost adolescent. The other's adolescent has the earphones on all the time. So this is kind of a rose. They're all. Uh, I have over. I have several hundred titles for roses, and then there's several hundred roses, and we haven't put the titles and the individual sculptures together again. This is another one. Pixie likes this one. And uh, they're presented on a little lazy Susan, so you can kind of rotate them and see uh, different sides of them. And uh, this is one of my favorites. This is a frying pan upside down that uh, Pixie complains that a lot of things go into these roses. And she says, I never gave you that. <laughs> right? and, and wasn't it, this was a frying pan that you said was no good and had to be replaced. Yeah, it was Am fried. Right? Yeah, it was a frying. <laughs> okay. And so, so this is it. They just come up uh, the same way that roses come now, up. Now, coming from a family of engineers and linear thinkers, actually, you're, I think, wasn't your grandfather the uh, mayor of Berkeley? Yes, he was. He was the professor of entomology and parasitology. My great uncle was the mayor of San Francisco. Uh -huh. I, they probably knew each other, and I wonder how we ended up with these nonlinear kinds of ways of relating. Well, see, I saw, you know, the, my grandfather, the entomology and the parasitology, they solved yellow fever, uh, sanitation problems. Then my father went into the raising of agriculture in the Sacramento Valley uh, around World War II. And I really felt that the next step was uh, spiritual nourishment, and that's where the arts come in, and that's where I think that you and I became interested in, uh, you know, putting out a spread like a smorgasbord, uh, you know, that, that's not just things that go in your mouth, that go in your eyes and your ears. Spiritual seekers. Yeah. Pixie, tell us about you. Well, um, you I You started actually, as an actress, is that correct? Well, no, I actually started as a musician. Um, we did some acting. My family is uh, very uh, musical and uh, we did some theater. Um, I played trombone and flute and worked in a rock group for like 13 years. What was the name years. of it? The Weirs. It was with my eight brothers and sisters. No. Yeah. yeah. Was every one of your brothers and sisters artistic? They were all musicians. Really? Yes. Absolutely. And how did you switch over into visual art? Well, um, I was uh, talking to a, a jazz uh, musician who said that whenever he had an emotional reaction, he uh, played his instrument and I realized I didn't do that. Whenever I had an emotional reaction, I painted and wrote poetry. And I quit music about two months after that conversation. Did you, uh, conversation did you, like George, have no formal training, or were you trained as an artist? Um, I enrolled in school. I, I studied off and on. I had kind of created my own program. I went to a lot of, uh, you know, junior college. Uh, I studied at UCLA. I studied at Cal State LA. I, I, I had its formal um, kind of invented uh, education. 
George has said that you would not have met if you hadn't gone to a school where he was teaching, which was started by Laddie John Dill as a sort of an alternative to the structure of UCLA and the more formal schools. Right. What was it like? It was fantastic. It was the, uh, um, I can't even The School it. of Art and Architecture It was the Santa Monica yeah. College of Design, Art, and Architecture. And uh, as George says, by the time you've said the name, you've graduated. <laughs> <Yeah>. But, <laughs> you know, and it was a, it was a studio uh, school. school. Studio school. Yeah, and right. uh, it was, um, that was a major You part had the of best teachers in L.A. You had yeah. Frank Romero, Ann Thornycroft, Ann yeah. Troutman, Laddie. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was, it was. And you were Laddie's assistant, is that I, I correct? I came back as his teaching assistant, and that's uh, when we fell in love. Did you yeah. fall in love immediately? Um, I don't know. Did we? <laughs> that's a damn it's good a, question. It's, it's a work in progress, <laughs> actually. We're, we're still falling in love. Yeah, we're, we're working on that. Yeah. Now, what's it like? Um, you know, in the when I first got into the art world in the 50s, um, with the abstract expressionists, it was only the men who showed, and the women were teaching school. They didn't shave under their arms. They took care of these peacocks. Mm -hmm. Then the shift kind of occurred where you had to see the woman artist if you wanted to see the man. I mean, it was, it was a very dominating woman. How does it work for you two? I think it just, I think it flows pretty naturally back and forth. I don't think that either of us have a issue, man, woman, you know, it's, it's basically artist, artist, and whoever's uh, showing, showing, whoever's doing uh, stuff, you know, and then we're doing things together now. What is your life, uh, what is your day like? Um, well, uh, every day I think is kind of different. But do you get up, you separate, go to your, I know you live in a tent in George's studio, is that correct? No. Oh, I see. The room yeah, is the like house, a tent. Yeah, the house of inspiration. Yeah, yeah. the inspiration, right. house. inspiration yeah. house, yeah. And then you go off to do your work next door. How do you, how I have do you a, set your day? I have a studio upstairs. Yeah, that's, that's evolved now. She has her own studio upstairs, which I go to when I'm invited. <laughs> Let's see some of your work. Do, do we have some examples of Pixie's work? Oh, this oh, is a, fantastic. a, a mural. This is a, a 700 square foot mural in the Flower District in downtown LA. And um, Now I have a screen which is sort of like a horizontal version of that. Right. How did you get that commission? Um, actually, uh, uh, through someone who knew, who had a piece of mine, um, they knew about this. and uh, That's beautiful. Let's yeah. go on to the next one. Oh, these, this is just a little overview of these paintings we're going to see in a, in a bit because these, uh, these next series of paintings, if, if uh, that's what follows, um, came out of um, a series of cards that I designed. They were artist note cards. I designed them, uh, painted them for these cards, and then the paintings came out of the cards. So it's the reverse of the, the way that it's often done where um, and these are the paintings, actually, that are much larger, um, that evolved out of the, the cards that were produced as... These are kind of like uh, Mark Kostabi's work, in that you have these faceless individuals, but they represent humanity. Yes, the, the, the idea is uh, to connect to um, a larger spirit and not to individualize them down so specifically. And it kind of pulls you into more of a personality and these are more about the idea rather than the personality. Who are of those person. two girls? Are the, is that you and your sister, or is that one person? No, those are those are um, archetypal. Yeah, universe. They aren't they aren't uh, 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 specific people at all. They're they're more yeah u as universal. Fantastic. Figures. Next. Uh, this is a series that's going to Houston in uh, September. Um, this is my bridge series. Um, uh, we're, we actually live right next to the First Street Bridge, and I think that the bridge kind of wandered into the paintings, you know, out through the window, <laughs> came in. And this is another of that. That series. is wonderful. So you've incorporated some of George's ideas in that you're using three-dimensional objects. Uh, yeah, but I'm, they're painted, so they're they're kind of my collage, but they come in in a different. Why manner. screens? Well, I was doing screens and tables, and I, I like to, um, I think it's really important to add, uh, to put art into your everyday life. And uh, I think I have a little bit of a Bauhausian instinct in the sense that utilitarian objects should be related to, um, to the art world and should um, bring that magic into to one's everyday reality. 
Um, and now not Pete Volkus, when he started working in clay, actually put holes in the clay so you couldn't consider it a utilitarian object right. because the water would go right through it. Do you have that same thing? Here you're using a Matisse design. Um, I don't think I have, I don't think it really matters to me whether or not you can use the object or not. I don't think that's important to me at all. I think that it's, uh, I think it's wonderful if you can use an object and it has beauty and art in it. Do you find there's a prejudice against women artists today? Is it harder for you being, oh, here's a good one. What? This is another part of the Bridge series. That's fantastic. Do you find it's harder for you to get a gallery than it is uh, a man? Um, I think there are still prejudices, but um, I don't think they're the way they used to be, or as strong as they used to be. Actually. Now, George, you've always been a rebel, and uh, it, you particularly see it in your dealings with art dealers. You've had, I, I remember working for one art dealer where you were actually uh, sending really angry notes to him. Uh, <laughs> we won't say would. his name, but I uh, love that. I was that. having such a good time this morning. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, just pretend that, I'm your that, therapist. That, that, yeah, uh, uh, just a second, let me see this here. Uh, it says that, the, you know, uh, what I really want is, is somehow to have the Collector Brothers, Art and Bill, get together and talk to each other and leave me out of it. But uh, th this is where the dealers come in. The dealers then have to, to take uh, what uh, in my case now is a lot of respect and turn that respect into dollars. And so, so this is a, you know, it's an ongoing project. And, you know, the, I've been very blessed. You know, I've had people like Nick Wilder in my corner, you know. Tony, you have Tony Shafrazi. Tony Shafrazi. I've had some very beautiful um, dealers who have really supported me. I mean, before I exhibited with Nick, I used to go to his gallery, and we'd walk around in the alley, and he'd slip me a $100 bill, you know what I mean? So, and then one time he said, well, maybe we should try having an exhibition and see what happens. Nick wanted to put forward the idea that an artist should make as much as a highway patrolman every month. You know, we never achieved that, but at least we got that idea planted <laughs> in people's minds. <laughs> Uh, so, Tell us yeah. about what, what happened with that dealer that you didn't like. I remember I worked for him. We won't say his name, but I, I, I would ring one, one buzz. I was the receptionist. One buzz would be VIP, very important client. Two buzzes would be FBI. He was always on the edge of the law. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, the, the poet Robert Duncan visited him, and a sale was, was uh, consummated. And then I came in, and he said, I'm sorry, I don't have anything for you. And so it was a, a sale of my work. And so there, this kind of, you know, activity, I responded with a manifesto, you know, that, um, and I was, was very adamant and that I used, uh, the, the printer in the valley didn't even want to print it. He thought it was a libel suit. Um, but, you know, there have been so many more people, you know, who have supported me. That, I mean, this, we're almost into that yellow journalism area that it seems more exciting. Okay, this is the largest rose. This is the Event Horizon rose I'm standing next to. So it's like eight or ten feet tall. So the roses that we saw were like, you know, tabletop pieces, some of them only six inches high. Uh, and then they go to this uh, eight or ten foot high piece, which is, is really, as it's revolved, uh, a series, it, it may be in a still life show people want, because what I, I'm doing really is I'm setting up a whole series of still lifes, Pixie would paint them, but I'm actually just setting them up and wiring them and nailing them down. So does the idea of couples turn your stomach or do you, do you like it? Like Oldenburg and his wife are re really work today as a couple. Do you like it? Well, I think if, if it works, it's great. If it doesn't, you know, it's like anything else. I, I, don't, th I don't think that uh, we planned on, you know, being a couple in, in advance of being one. <laughs> How do you yeah. find dealers, Pixie? Do you have trouble getting dealers or do you have trouble with working with them? Yeah, I... Does the authority bother you? Uh, I, find, I find it still a, an awkward area that, uh, you know, I think there's always issues in the, in the dealer area. What's your idea of beauty? My idea of beauty is harmony. I think that uh, I think it comes from my music training. Is is my idea of beauty is when things resonate at a uh, at a very harmonious pitch when they're in tune, uh, whether it's visual or audio. Um, I think that when everything connects together and has this this harmony and this connection and this balance, that that is beauty to me. And what is your idea of truth? Uh, 
that's it. <laughs> <laughs> what about for you, George? Mm -hmm. You talk about uh, truth a lot. Yeah. Um, well, that's, uh, you know, I, we used to have something called a pineal gland, which is like our third eye, and I always thought that was like a truth-seeking device, device, you know, yeah. that, that, that somehow we could see it, and I think we still have that, and I think as children, I think children have a real good ear for the truth and when they're being bullshitted, you know, so I uh, basically have, have always tried to go after the truth and then like a two-year-old shred it bite it bounce it and see if it still lasts because there's some very fragile truths and then for example some, uh, well you know this this series of boxes that we we were were born in a like a little crib and then a playpen and as soon as you find out you can stack some toys and get out of the playpen then you're in the room and then you find out you can get out the window and then you're in the yard and you go over the fence and then you're into society and then if you fuck up they'll put you back in a, to, uh, a, a minimum security then maximum security then solitary confinement and then a pine coffin so there's this series of boxes and the rules uh, as a parent and as a child we're told don't do that why because I said not to do it so there are natural laws you touch the hot stove you burn your hand but there's some other things that I say to the kids just don't do that because I don't want to be bugged and so that's that testing of what is an absolute foundation and that's why every generation kind of kicks over the previous generation to see what is the foundation of what what is just paper, you know, houses of cards. You have compared the art scene, which changes every 15 years, to periods in art history, or mm -hmm. in history itself, for example, the Hudson River School, or the, the, mm -hmm. the discovery of the West. Mm -hmm. Well, that really came about when they did the Beat Culture Show at the Whitney, and that was a 15-year period, and I kind of traveled like Jiminy Cricket, the conscience, with that show, because uh, there's a 15-year period after the Civil War for 15 years. The only time that all those cowboy movies are based on with all the horse shit and the rugged individualism and take a gun and settle things with a gun. You know, and so that, that 15 year period, we're eating it because of that mythology that came out of that. And I wanted to make sure that the um, beat experience was about poetry, music, art, literature. And so no gunfighting. No. <laughs> George, when I got into the art world at the Abstract Expressionist uh, no. period, if you were a realist painter, you were yeah. just left out. Today, it seems that anything goes. How do you each or both of you feel about that? Uh, do you want to take that? No, I think you should go. Well, I think the, um, that anything goes was the whole idea of assemblage art, is, is that, that that followed Abstract Expressionism as attempt to bring chunks of reality, John Altoon would put some uh, window screen embedded into the pigment on his canvas. You know, so this, this idea of bringing reality back into the work. And then in assemblage, especially in my case, the breadth of the horizon of the raw materials. You know, nothing should be, you know, uh, 19th century, you know, they had the materials you had to use as a sculptor, they had the ideas you had to use as a sculptor, all of that was set up, and, and I think in the middle of the 20th century when that mushroom cloud went up and the Holocaust, we said, wait a second, you know, we want, well, the futurists also wanted all materials of modern life available for artists. And so I, that anything goes has, you know, another side to that sword is that then what, you know, if anything goes, then what do you have to say? So you're, yes, you have this incredible vocabulary of all this, these fantastic words, but are you going to make a poem with them? I remember once uh, Norman Lear bought a piece of yours. It was a great big drum, and it had bullet holes in it so that it couldn't hold anything. And I think the gardener took it out by mistake or something. Do you find delight when people don't know your work is art? Uh, well, that's always a, uh, an issue, you know, it's whether I've alchemically taken this piece of crap and made it into something elegant and beautiful. What about you, Pixie? Well, um, I think that my work is a very different world than his work. It's, uh, it's very specific. I deal with, with uh, a structure that... Um, Frames. Yeah, the, f the framing and also um, I think that the frame is representative of 
you know what you were talking about earlier about everything being a possibility is that then you have to deal with the internal structure of the artist and that bringing in um, you know forming a structure and actually you know it allows them to really develop a specific voice um, in whatever way they choose but you have to bring that to the work I believe that you do have your own internal structure as an artist and that you know what's happening there and um, and you were talking about truth earlier and in music there was a great term called uh, you know having a jive detector and um, and that's where what I think that uh, you know when I look at a piece or when I'm making work I have that on and and if if there's something that's false in the work the painting throws it right back at me until I correct it actually um, especially further along in a piece very quickly the last question I have heard it said by some pretentious art critic that an orgasm gets rid of one piece of art every time you have <laughs> sex you lose that <laughs> <creative impetus. laughs> what do you think okay. in the last uh, minute I think he wasn't getting enough <laughs> 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 well, well we, we've discussed the football coach that also yeah. says you shouldn't have sex before the football game, you know. Yeah. And, and I think it's the other way around. I think sex, better, better I think sex lubricates player. art. I don't think yeah. that it uh, replaces yeah. Yeah. it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you want to be in five years? Um, in five years as an artist, you yes. mean? Um, well, <laughs> I, would, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> as a person living... Um, well, I want to be doing the same, you know, be working, doing the same things we're doing now. And what about you, George? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in five years, I want to be able to come in here and tell you about whatever it is, the roses of five years from now. It's, Thank it's you. the Duke Ellington thing, where they say, what's your best song? And he said, the one I'm writing tomorrow. Right. Thank you both for coming. You're My welcome. name is Molly Barnes. Art is not for everyone. It never has been. It never will be. But for those of us who love it, we want to turn you on.